uh, arrangement, and moreover, uh, not only you don't have the reserve army of labor, there is this iron rice bowl that secure worker stocks, and moreover, because of the historical revolutionary gains, and there has been pressure for the workers to participate in the management of the economic and the political power. So how could the surplus extraction be done in this kind of context? So yes, in this context, there was this debate. What in the first place appeared as a purely economic debate, uh, and but what turns out to be the actual reflection of the class struggle that took place in the context of socialist China. So what was the debate about? So on one hand, you have people like Mao Zedong and the revolution Marxists within the, within the Chinese Communist Party and arguing that in this socialist context, it's possible to have both social rights for the workers as well as industrialization. But for that to happen, the precondition was that the working class would be able to develop a level of socialist consciousness so that the workers would voluntarily contribute to socialist public goods. But how could that happen? For that to happen, the precondition is that you need to have a social arrangement which fight for the gradual elimination of inequality, which would gradually limit and then eliminate the historical privilege for people such as intellectuals, for party and the government officials. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have people like Liu Shaoqi or Deng Xiaoping or the so-called revisionists. They argue that this is not possible. Instead, you have to appeal to the so-called material incentives. So instead of encouraging people to develop social consciousness, they argue that they have to appeal to people's pursuit of self-interest. So at first, it may appear that it's simply a matter of economic mechanism. Uh, but in fact, by doing this mechanism of material incentive, over time it will create a greater and greater degree of inequality. And moreover, it would create a justification for more material privilege for intellectuals or government and the party officials. And then, by creating greater inequality, it would further undermine the possibility to consolidate and develop socialist consciousness. That will in turn become the justification for more material incentives, more inequality. So what initially appear as a purely economic technical mechanism and eventually would pave the way for the rise of capitalism. So it's for that reason that Mao talked about that. Under this historical stage of socialism, and in effect, what we are talking about is a socialist state within the capital world system. Inevitably, there will be classes and the class conflicts and the class struggle. There will be struggle between the socialist role and the capitalist role. There would be the danger of capitalist restoration. And in the Chinese context, of course, this struggle between the socialist role and the capitalist role eventually culminated in the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976, and we all know the historical results. Uh, unfortunately, the, the struggle ended with the triumph of capitalist rulers, and with the 1976 Counter Revolution coup, the capitalist rulers were able to consolidate 
their political power. That was then followed by the privatization in the rural areas first, which made it possible for the release of massive cheap labor force. And on that basis, the Chinese and the foreign capitalist enterprises were developed. And then by the 1990s, it was moreover followed by the uh, massive uh, privatization of the remaining state-owned enterprises. And so by the late 1990s of the uh, early 2000s, so basically the capital transition in China was completed. Now the rise of capitalism in China was not only a major historical defeat for the Chinese working class, it also played a not small and possibly a decisive role for the rise of global neoliberalism. So why was that? Now here, let's look at this, this graph, uh, which basically shows the historical movement of the profit rate uh, of the U.S. economy. If we take this largest capitalist economy, okay, of course, we all know that. Uh, capitalism is a system based on the production for profit. And so uh, profit, you can think about that as the basic indicator of the health of the capitalist economy from the capitalist point of view. right? Uh, so if you look at this graph, you can see that the U.S. profit rate rose dramatically from the trough during the 1930s, which was of course the time of Great Depression. Okay, so rise from the trough of Great Depression, and then uh, reached quite high level uh, during the time of World War II, and stayed at comparatively high level until the 1960s. So that was the basis for the capitalist boom from the 1950s to 1960s. However, it declined from the mid-1960s until the early 1980s. And similar decline of profit rate happened in other major capital countries, and also in Europe. So that was a time when the Western working classes were undertaking uh, quite militant struggles against capitalism. And then from the 1980s to 1990s, it was the time of neoliberalism, which created conditions that favored the recovery of the uh, capitalist profit rate. And that in turn created conditions for the young boom from the late 1990s to short, uh, early 2000s and especially the boom of the financial markets. So if you look at this graph, there's uh, one question we can think about. Uh, yesterday, uh, one of the commentators raised the question about uh, whether uh,